You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. You can make this possible. All right, folks. Uh, let's talk about this here. Early I showed you Kaylee McEnany uh, and her insane, insane defense of Donald Trump's uh, Confederate tweets trying to slam Bubba Wallace. Then we had, of course, uh, his just beyond stupid speech over the weekend at Mount Rushmore, and that travesty of an event happening in D.C. It's real clear who Donald Trump appealing to. We knew at the moment he came down that escalator when he ran for president uh, in 2015 and all the other media people not paying attention, black people, we knew what was going on. That's why I use the hashtag, hashtag, we tried to tell you. Well, He's really dealing with white politics. And everybody, of course, is so focused on what white people think, because frankly, they've been the majority in this country and the dominant force, but that is changing. We're 23 years away from America becoming a nation majority of people of color. In our new book, Lena Maxwell, Maxwell has this, The End of White Politics, How to Heal Our Liberal Divide. She joins me right now. Jelena, what's happening? What's up? How are you? Uh, glad to have you on the show. Um, bottom line is, when you talk about how to heal our liberal divide. So are you really dealing with white politics on the liberal side or white politics overall? I think, you know, I'm a Democrat. I've worked for Democratic uh, presidential campaigns. So I think, you know, I was focused on the Democratic side, but that doesn't mean that I ignore Republicans because they are looking at the same data that I was looking at. So when P Pew Research is projecting that America will be a minority white nation by 2045, Republicans are hearing that data as well. And since their voters are mostly white, they are trying to suppress the vote of those people of color that are uh, the majorities in many critical states. And they're trying to ensure uh, minority rule, uh, planning for that moment when people of color are the majority. So I don't ignore the Republicans, but I focus on Democrats because I think that they're playing a white politics when the base of the Democratic Party is not white. And so it is completely ridiculous that in 2020, heading into this election against Donald Trump again, we did not seem to learn the correct message uh, from the 2016 Electoral College defeat. Oh, and, and to that particular point, I mean, the, the thing that that um, th that gets me is like, look, look, I totally get it. Like, it amazes me, uh, like the whole talk. Hey, Senator Amy Klobuchar should be a great pick because she could really help us in the Midwest. And I'm going, but I thought that's why Biden was supposed to be the guy because he was white and he's supposed to be, get the people in Scranton um, and in Wisconsin and Michigan. And it's and I I keep making this this point that. Look, Democrats cannot continue to act like black people are political sharecroppers. We're going to till the land but not benefit financially from tilling the right. land. Well, here's the thing, Roland. Black people live in Detroit. They also live in Milwaukee and in Philadelphia. And so this idea that we're going to try to get back that white working class male voter in the Midwest is a fantasy. What we need to focus on is turning out the million plus black voters that turned out in 2012 and then for whatever reason, whether it was voter suppression or whatever else, they didn't show up in 2016. Additionally, I think we have to focus on turning out even more than that, because I think that there's really just a lack of concentrated focus and investment in communities to help build out the Democratic Party infrastructure so that we can actually turn out the vote and respond to issues as they come up. We go at the end of the election cycle that weekend before to ask people to GOTV without giving them substantive reasons to vote. Well, part of that, and let's just go ahead and be clear, part of that is because when you talk about these campaigns, you have candidates who get it, but your campaign apparatus, a bunch of white folks. And so let, let's just be real clear. Um, you know, look, I, I, I can, we can go ahead and say it in 2016, you were on the Hillary Clinton campaign. Jameer Burley was on the campaign. Here were black people who, before they got on the campaign, I could get on my show without any problem. Y'all get on the campaign, and I can't get y'all on the show. And y'all are sitting there on the inside saying, hey, white people, 
We're here to do shows like this. <laughs> and they made it difficult. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. And y'all sitting there like, uh, I would love to do it, but uh, the white folks over here they got other ideas. Yeah, that was a really frustrating thing uh, about 2016. I think, you know, when you're talking about a presidential campaign, it's such a large bureaucracy that there's so many different levels of approval from you asking me to come on and me actually being allowed to come on. I think I did come on a couple of times, but it definitely was something where it had to go through that levels um, of approvals before it could actually happen. What I'm trying to say in this book is there shouldn't need to be levels of approval to right. have black staff, first of all, to have the black staff that's necessary. Now, in 2020, compared to 2016, Biden is woefully insufficient in terms of black women he's hired, black people he's hired, and so he has work to do there. But in 2016, you know, there was black women all over the place all around me um, on the Hillary Clinton campaign. And part of the problem was I felt like we were not then um, publicly facing. And so people had no insight that there were more black women on Hillary's campaign than any campaign in American history. And I think that that would have been helpful to at least allow people to have a more open mind um, towards Hillary's candidacy and her, her potential plans for their lives. I think that you know if they had seen black women on the inside, I think that we are validators. I think that we're the moral compass. We are the moral center of the Democratic Party and I think the progressive movement and the nation, frankly, to quote Mignon Moore, she's told me that recently. And so I think that we are the ones that you need on the inside and along your side as you're trying to go and be the president. I mean, you can't win without us. But here's the deal, it wasn't just black women. I mean, I remember trying to get Alvin Brown on my Tom Jonas segment, and here was the craziest thing. And again, this, what this speaks to is, for me, the problem is that when you look at who's running, who's in control of the money, who's in control of the apparatus, and the bottom line, as you start going up, it gets wider and wider and wider and male, male, male. We were at the Congressional Black Caucus. This is September 2016. I tell Hillary Clinton directly, like, we're three feet away saying, I can't get people on. I'm trying to call for your surrogates. And then I'm like, y'all got a problem with black men. Uh, do y'all see what's going on? Can I get a, I said, who are the black men supporting your campaign? Why aren't you getting them out there? Huma's there, Marlon Marshall's there. And at one point, Huma goes, uh, secretary, we're gonna get it done. She says, get it done. I'm tired of the excuses. And I was like, uh-oh. Now, then they get pissed at me because I raised the question. And I'm sitting there going, the next day, the next day, I asked for Alvin Brown, 11 hours, Zerlina, 11 hours. I didn't get an answer. And then finally, I think I just booked, book, book, booked a black woman and had her on. But the issue that we have, that we are always making the point is that we're frozen out of the apparatus. We're frozen out of the decision making. We're frozen out of the money. And so if you chose to be a black political consultant, you get frozen out of the contracts Yet white boys over here are pulling down several million dollars repeatedly. That's also part of this problem when you talk about the end of white politics because they only see themselves and they control the levers of power and money. Yeah, I talk about that in the book. I talk about the white male consulting class uh, in Washington, D.C. and outside of D.C. that work on Democratic campaigns. They go from one to the next. And oftentimes they think they know everything. And I think that part of the problem with that, I mean, we see this in the media as well, you know, white men who are in charge, they sort of sit up on a perch and they observe and they feel like they can then understand and, you know, provide the best strategy for an experience that they have never had. And I think that the, the problem in 2016, I'm not seeing it as much in 2020 because I think that people are much more open about these kinds of issues, particularly in this racial reckoning we're going through. But I do think in 2016, part of the problem was um, you know, it just took too long uh, for, you know, folks like myself, folks like Minyan Moore and Maya Harris um, to sort of get the message across of some of the chain changes that needed to be made. But I do ultimately think, you know, in hindsight um, that, you know, the campaign did improve, you know, it just wasn't enough at the end. Um, you have a chapter, you have a chapter called um, the hashtag kids. Yes. Um, and, and the reality is appealing to those voters is a lot different than appealing to Gen X and Baby Boomer. 
Absolutely. You need to know how to use all of the social media platforms and you know, you need to know how, what content to put on those platforms and which surrogates potentially to use instead of Joe Biden, because, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily want Joe Biden on TikTok, but you want to make sure that his presence is ubiquitous throughout all social media platforms so that people that exist on those platforms and are using it in their daily lives are paying attention and are engaged, not just to vote in November uh, for the president, but also to vote for all those down ballot races. And I think that, you know, part of the errors I'm seeing so far is just the assumption that Joe Biden as the messenger is the wrong person to talk to young people. That may be true. I, I don't know that that's true. I actually think that, you know, he's a pretty authentic guy. So I feel like he can sort of talk to anybody. That's one of his strengths in this moment, strangely. But I think that, you know, part of the problem is, is they, they generally think that only the principal can be the messenger for the campaign. Um, and their, you know, surrogates are used in a, tr a strategic fashion. One of the things I hope they do, and I think that they're going to start doing it because I've seen that they're going to start doing um, influencer IG lives with uh, campaign surrogates and celebrities with big followings so that they can at least get the message out in in those uh, social media platforms where the millennials and the Gen Z kids are. Because if you, I mean, you know, in 2016, there was sort of a, a dearth of knowledge about black Twitter, what it is, you know, what's going on there and how to engage with black people uh, generally in social media spaces. So I think that that's one of the things um, that they can improve upon in this cycle. And I, I see them taking steps to do that. That's refreshing to see. One of the things that uh, uh, th this chapter on, on, on the white resistance, I, I think is quite interesting because I, I think part of this issue is that when you talk about campaigns, uh, white folks don't see themselves in terms of their whiteness. So what will happen is, I use this phrase, they'll, they'll say, well, Joe Biden is going to meet with a group of black pastors. Uh, Joe Biden is going to meet with a group of Latino activists. And then it's, Joe Biden's going to meet with a group of business leaders. Were well, they all white? And so th they are uncomfortable. It's like they've been in power so long, they will identify everybody else based upon a group of women, a group of blacks, a group of Latinos, where I'm like a group of white folks. And, and, and they're going to have to get used to being being called that. And it sort of shakes them at their core because they're kind of like, whoa, hold up. I'm like, yeah, if you're going to say meet with a group of black preachers, I'm going to say he meet with a group of white preachers. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe it should be meeting with white preachers, preachers on the Democratic side. Um, but I do think, you know, part of the problem is, is we default to white as an identity, as, you know, the identity that we start from and then everything else is identity politics. Basically, what I'm saying in this book is that is backwards. We are doing identity politics, we just call it politics. And right. we start from the position that white men and what they want and what they need is, it trumps everything, you know, for lack of a better term. And so when, when, I think, when, when, and so when, I think- when, when they make up 36% barely yeah. of the population, like, oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I like to always remind people is that, you know, by 2045, uh, when white people are a minority, that we should we should also stop saying this this term that I love to hear sometimes we're going to become a majority minority country no white Americans will be the minority that is the sentence people of color mostly Lat Latinx people frankly um, will make up the majority in many states even before 2045 in four states they already are so I think that you know everybody needs to get the memo now because Republicans actually are already going about efforts to suppress this vote that is emerging as a majority in many of these places. That's why they're putting people on the bench. That's why they're doing voter ID. That's why they're trying to suppress the vote. They understand the numbers. The Democrats just didn't get the memo. It is. It is. So one of the things that I do want to talk about, you, you, you speak about uh, the, the Obama coalition. And, and, and one of the things that, that I don't think people really, really understand is that T to me, the Obama coalition wasn't necessarily, oh, just this multiracial group. What it really was also was activating people who were in those critical groups. Mm -hmm. You talk about in the book, 75 million um, um, millennials, more than baby boomers. But the key is having demographic numbers means nothing if you don't exercise your actual power by voting. Right. And so the Obama coalition, they actually did that. 
And, and, and that to me, so you can, so people can tout, oh, the Obama coalition, but if you don't get the Obama coalition out to vote, it means nothing talking about a coalition. Oh, yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. I think what I'm saying is that you sort of want to rebuild the same coalition, multiracial coalition of voters, but you actually have to try to get those different voters, right? And part yes, to yes. your point about um, the young people and how Obama, particularly in Iowa in 2008, 2007, was able to um, you know, turn out young voters in Iowa, college students, sporadic voters that don't vote in every single election, you know, he was able to remake the electorate. In this instance, we don't necessarily have to remake anything, but it would be very good um, to not rely only upon, you know, what pollsters like to define as the likely voter, the voter who voted in the most recent presidential, two presidential elections. Um, because there are myriad reasons why somebody would skip an election or miss an election. And so they should still be spoken to by the party infrastructure or the campaign. And so what I'm saying um, in the Obama coalition chapter is, it's one thing to identify who your voters are, but you actually have to try to talk to them. Part of the thing, part of the problem with the way the Democrats go about it is that they, they literally don't even try. They're like, well, Donald Trump is terrible and racist. I mean, who else are you gonna vote for? I mean, that's basically the argument because they don't provide um, you know, substantive messaging and actual investment um, in those communities to turn out and, those sporadic voters that you're talking about and, when and when also and also and also and also also boots on the ground. So you have this passage where you say, "My time on the Obama campaign as a field organizer in Virginia was very different from my time with Hillary in 2016, where I spent every day as a director of progressive media in the campaign's Brooklyn headquarters." clicking away at my MacBook keyboard, hoping that our message was reaching our audience. Campaigns like to say they are doing what Obama did and knocking on doors, but you'll notice that they usually aren't until it's already too late in the election cycle. These days, they do more phone banking than door knocking. The point of door knocking isn't just to engage voters the last weekend before the election in order to remind them to vote and make sure they know where to go, but to ask them first and foremost, what is it? What is it that they need? That's pretty much what Ella Baker always said. You yeah. go to the show sharecroppers and say, what do you care about? And now I then have to then speak to you on how my candidate speaks to those issues. That's exactly right. I mean, I think, you know, part of the problem is that they, they show up too late asking for your vote, but they haven't provided a reason. And you need to, you need to give folks a reason. You need to show up early and be in communication on the ground. I mean, when I was a field organizer in 2008, it was my first job on a presidential campaign. It's the brunt work of a campaign. But one of the things I learned is that there were people I was talking to three and four times. So the third time I'm talking to Judy on the doors, you know, about the black president, the first black president, Barack Obama, you know, she, she may have leaned Republican, but the third time she knows who I am at this point. So part of, part of what Obama did really well, I mean, I was among... Uh, the, the type of field organizer that went to a battleground state. But one of the things he did really, really well, it, he incorporated what's, what I call, or what they called the neighbor to neighbor program, which I cite in the book, which is basically people signing up and creating their own precinct teams. Now, this is not, you know, a, a novel idea that no one has ever come up with right. before, and Democrats everywhere do this, but I think that they actually need to be serious about it. And, and instead, what they, what they often do is you know they'll they'll do all of the GOTV uh, motions, <laughs> they'll go through the motions, um, but they're not actually their heart isn't in it, and they're coming too late, and they're going to church service every Sunday, you know, a month before the election, but they're not talking to anybody who's outside of that church, and so they need to look <laughs> at the the black community and brown community as the fulsome and diverse communities they are, and go and speak to them in the in those actual communities and stop just going, um, you know, where you traditionally would assume people are, like a church service. What is your, what is your assessment? And I, it, it, you talk about, in the Obama Coalition chapter, you talk about Senator Cory Booker, uh, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. But you look at this year, you had, you had um, um, Congressman Julian Castro, you had Booker, Harris, who were running. Why do you think the minority candidates were not able to connect? Was it this belief that after 16, oh my God, we have to get an old white guy? And then it became this self-fulfilling prophecy where the only way we can compete, because look, I'll be honest, every time I turned on Morning Joe 
and I and you saw stuff on CNN. It was Michael Moore. Oh, we got to listen to these people in the Rust Belt. And I'm sitting there going, no, we don't. They need to be listening to some <laughs> other people as well. And I think what I think what happened, it became a self fulfilling prophecy that the only way we can compete against Trump is to go get an old white guy. And folks just said, okay, that's it. What do you think happened? Why 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 the black and Latino candidates could not connect with those voters in those early states? I think, you know, it's a couple different reasons because, you know, as you know, we have a me media filter. So everything that we're learning and understanding about these candidates is through that filter. And that filter is just like the campaign problem where you have mostly white men in charge. And so, you know, you're only getting a narrow perspective. Um, and that's why you saw, for example, more positive coverage about Mayor Pete versus Senator Kamala Harris or Senator Amy Klobuchar or Senator Elizabeth Warren. And I don't know about you, but like a mayor of a small town versus three women senators. I mean, there's there is three people in that conversation that are very serious contenders for president. And then there's Mayor Pete, who is a very nice person. But I just don't think that, you know, the way the media covered him as if he was the second coming of Obama. I mean, people really said that. Um, yeah. You know, that, that, <laughs> and, that they were really, former Obama people, really, <laughs> former Obama people. Right. I was like really confronting the privileges that he was afforded because he was showing up in a white man's body. And so, you know, part of the problem is, is that you you just you you have um, a lack of imagination when it comes to who can be in positions of power when it we were definitely traumatized after 2016. And so people definitely were concerned about who those white voters were going to vote for. I don't mm -hmm. know how many times I heard, you know, older black voters say, well, I like Kamala, but I don't know if other people will vote for Kamala or a black woman or insert the name of another candidate there. So I think part of the problem is, is that the fear of what sort of white moderate voters will do. But part of the, part of what I'm saying in the book is we don't have to worry about them. We don't have to worry about them. First of all, the the more conservative white voters, they're Republicans. They are right. Republicans and they have always been Republicans. When the 53% of white women voted for uh, Donald Trump, that was not a surprise. That was consistent with 2012, 2008, and beyond. We have we have we don't win the white vote on the Democratic side. We haven't won the white vote since 1964. So I think part of our strategy should stop um, only supporting and financing, frankly, candidates of color um, who are more diverse and and come from different backgrounds because we are afraid that white Americans, white more more moderate white Americans, won't vote for a history making candidate like that. I think, you know, 2016 was a machination of a lot of different factors. If you list, you know, 10 factors, why Hillary Clinton lost the electoral college, all of them are correct. They're all correct, right? You don't know which one had more or less to do with it. If it was Russia, if it was voter suppression, all of the, her, her gender, all of these things are relevant. The point is, is that all of those things are gonna be happening going forward. So what are we going to do about the fact that right. bias exists, sexism exists, racism exists, voter suppression exists? And so now we have to work within the world that we actually live in, but the numbers are actually on our side. So let's actually act like Republicans and, and get to work um, with the numbers that are on our side and use them to our advantage instead of just allowing them to suppress those votes that, are, you know, could and potentially help Democrats make Congress different, make the Senate different, and make the White House different. Well, but also, I, I think that's also a part of which, when you say the end of white politics, we got to go ahead and say it. We got to have the end of white media. See, I, th I think I think a huge part of this is, frankly, who is controlling those shows, who's controlling who are the producers. Who are the executives? And so when I use the hashtag, we tried to tell you, black people knew exactly what Trump was going to do. Black people read what Coretta Scott King said about Jeff Sessions. Black people saw Donald Trump for exactly what he was. But I remember, I remember sitting there watching uh, uh, Joe Scarborough and uh, Mark, what was his name? Um, oh, the one who got fired. Uh, Mark Alfred. Halperin just sort of dismissed the early story about how Trump treats women. And I watched these other stories. And, I watch, and I'm sitting there and I'm going, do y'all not see what's going on? And I think to your point about how media drives it, you did not have 
black people who were hosts, who, who were on shows every day for longer than five or six minutes. You did not have black executives who could say, ah, we see this thing. So just like when you talk about how we see these things differently in campaigns, we also see these things differently in media. And that's the reason why I think to your point, why Buddha judge all of a sudden, oh my God, he's white male and he speaks so great in these different languages. He's gay and all these different things. And black people kind of like, mm, but 150,000 or less people in your city and now you're going to be the next president? When there was a dude, Wayne Messam, who actually was the mayor of a larger city in Florida who got no attention whatsoever, I think media is a huge part of this, too. I, I do think the media plays a role. I definitely address that in the book. I do think that, you know, the sexism and the racism and those biases that I'm talking about in terms of campaign staff, I, I mean, I've existed on both sides. So I can see... Um, both of the biases at play, whether I'm, you know, in a TV segment or whether or not I was working on the campaign. And some, you know, most of it is not in, you know, malicious. It, it's, it's literally blind spots that people have because they only have one lived experience. And of course, you know, just because you live one life and you're exposed to a lot of different other people, it doesn't mean you can speak for, for the black experience or you know how to cover appropriately the black experience. And I think that you know, one of the things that's been revealed in this moment is that the surprise um, after George Floyd's murder um, of the protests and everybody sort of going outside in the middle of a pandemic, understanding, you know, what was really truly at stake, you know, the surprise would not have happened if you had black and brown staffers um, and also uh, media folks um, working within these organizations because they would have told you many months ago what was going to happen. You would have, you would have had, uh, you know, an eye to what was going on on the ground because you would have had, you know, some people in the meeting. I mean, my big thing is, you know, I, I don't want to be the only black person in a meeting anymore. It is 2020. Right. Um, we're, we're moving towards a minority <laughs> white nation. You sure you, you, you want to be like Beyonce when she went to the meeting with Reebok. It's kind of like, uh, uh, no, yeah. I'm out. Nobody looked like me. I'm out. <laughs> I mean, that means how could they actually understand you as a black person if there is no one present who is black? I mean, I just think that all white spaces, I don't understand them because I just feel like every space that I've ever been in that was like fulsome and actually vibrant, it was diverse. It was inclusive. It had people from all around. And if you have just one kind of person, flavor. Yeah, we it's bring like, flavor. Yeah, we it's bring like, flavor. <laughs> by white people are still having all white anything. Um, I think that if you are, if you find yourself in an all white meeting or all white space, you need to ask why you need to raise your hand in that meeting and be like, why right. is this meeting all white? Because that is a problem within whatever organization you're working in. All right, then. Hey, final question. I know they haven't announced it. All this talk. Joanne Reed's supposed to get a 7 p.m. show, whatever the heck might be opening on the weekend. You want it? You want to be a television show host? I will do anything um, when they present me an opportunity. I, I just do, I, I don't have a plan. I mean, I think the book was a part of a plan, but if they ask me to host, yes, I'll host. Of course, and I'll be amazing. <laughs> well, be sure, make sure you get top shelf money too. That's, that's, yes. also, key. that's also key. They want us to host, but they don't want us to host for top shelf money. I'm just saying. You need All right, y'all, the book. <laughs> Absolutely. Y'all, the book is called The End of White Politics, How to Heal Our Liberal Divide. Uh, Jelena Maxwell, Jelena, we certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hold my unfiltered video in just one moment. All right, folks, the folks, the folks at Seek.com have an incredible offer for you folks. And these are these 360-degree 4D headphones that you can use for music. You can use Bluetooth. You can for gamers, all that sort of stuff. Uh, Mary Spiel is a sister. She's actually the inventor of these headphones. Phenomenal. I love the sound of these. They also have the virtual reality headsets, which allow for you to actually watch uh, VR uh, virtual reality videos, 360-degree videos. You just simply pop your phone right into here. And then, of course, if you uh, you can also go like to, like YouTube has an app uh, as well. 
uh, that uh, has a has a uh, channel that deals with a lot of those VR ads. And so you can actually uh, do all of that, folks. Uh, check this out and pop it on. And guess what? Check out your vi virtual reality videos. Go to seek.com, C-E-E-K.com, seek.com, C-E-E-K.com. Use this promo code right here, RMVIP2020, RMVIP2020, for a discount on these headphones. And then, of course, when you support them, you support this show, Roller Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.